Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. Hopkins County, Kentucky, famous for its invasion of little green men back in the 1950s also seems to have a problem with hairy monsters that possess a natural talent for frightening away local nature lovers of all types and persuasions. In October of 1990, Bigfoot was sighted in Hopkins County near Erlington, a place known as the Heckley Mines by father and son deer hunters. The son was sitting in a stand, he said, when he became aware of a large brown bush that he hadn't noticed before. Suddenly, and to his complete amazement, the bush stood up. It had the shape of a man, he stated. It was a medium brown color and was huge. I was beyond stunned. His father observed the creature as well from his own stand not far away. It slowly made its way back into the woods, and the two frightened hunters left the area as quickly as possible. One evening, around 9 p.m. in November 1995, four campers in White Plains, Kentucky, were disturbed by loud, unexplainable moaning sounds coming from a thickly forested area known as the Lonesome Woods. It was really cold, and we had a big fire going, one witness later stated. We were all sitting around it to stay warm, when, all of a sudden, this weird moaning sound filled the woods. It sounded kind of like a siren, except it was very loud. Whatever it was let out a series of three moans, which started at a low pitch, building and dropping in volume in three bursts. This scared us because we all grew up in this area and have hunted and camped out here all our lives and have never heard such a cry. We tried to laugh it off, but an uneasy feeling lingered throughout the camp for quite a while. That happened about 9 p.m. At around 10.30, one of the group stepped out of the tent to relieve himself, then came running back in and announced that he was leaving immediately. When they asked him what was wrong, he admitted that he'd just seen a big, hairy monster drinking from a nearby stream. It had stood up and watched him, he said, as he ran away. No sooner had he told his story than the group heard something running through the underbrush at the top of the hill. Shining their light in that direction, they saw a very large creature running on top of the hill. We couldn't make out a color, but it was human-shaped, he said, with long arms, and it ran kind of hunched over. It looked to be about eight feet tall, the witnesses claimed. The witnesses claimed that it made an incredibly loud exit as it ran away on two legs over a ridge, loudly snapping and breaking through the limbs and small trees. It sounded like a truck driver driving over branches. Five years later, in the summer of 2000, near Morton's Gap, a couple out fishing one night on White City Road was startled by similar noises coming from the nearby trees. It was a rustling sound, said the witness, that became a loud snapping crackling that seemed to come closer. There was a thumping sound as well. This lasted maybe a couple of minutes. We stood there, looking in the area, expecting someone to come out into the light. But no one ever came out. His wife was visibly shaken, but the witness reassured her, saying it was probably just a deer. As they recast their lines, they heard what sounded like something large running across the road, scattering gravel. 
Whatever it was sounded like it had slapped the truck three times as it went past. Then the sound of breaking limbs resumed on the other side of the woods. From the glow of their lanterns, they watched the branches of the trees shake and sway in the wake of something monstrously large and so heavy they could feel the thing's feet hitting the ground. They knew now what had made the earlier thumping sounds. Dropping their fishing poles, the witness pulled out his pistol and aimed it in the direction and cocked the hammer back as his wife cowered behind him, clinging to his belt loops. Now, thoroughly unnerved, the couple hurried back to their truck. Once back to the safety of the vehicle, it was a while before the witness garnered enough courage to go back and gather up their gear. They were doing so when they heard the creature let out a high-pitched, blood-curdling scream. And when it screamed, I did too, the witness stated. It sounded loud and close. The sound echoed out into the deep woods. It was unearthly, high-pitched, short, but it had a lot of emphasis, as if it meant to hurry us along. It worked. We left there fast. It was posed that this might be the same monster that was featured in a 1979 edition of a local newspaper about a three-day flurry of sightings in the Hopkins County area. The creature returned around midnight on March 28, 2007, when a couple driving west on Rose Creek Road near Nebo, Kentucky, spotted what they thought was a dead deer lying beside the road. As we approached, said witness Brad Law, the animal got up and walked on four feet into the middle of the road, then back across the road, nearly swiping my girlfriend's car. They turned to look and saw the beast running across a bean field on two legs rather than four. I know a lot of weird people that make up funny stories, Law said, but this was the real deal. Law described the thing as six foot tall, completely black in color, with long furry legs, a big belly, and an ugly, very scary face which he found extremely intimidating. This thing took very large steps, he said. On January 9th, 2011, 11 years after the initial Morgan's Gap creature report, the monster was still scaring people on White City Road. Tommy Hill, then 28 years old, and his brother, Jeff Robertson, 36, were artifact hunting just across the road from the river. It was dark, around 7 p.m., but that was not a problem as they both had brought along flashlights. Upon arriving, we made our way to the water side with our flashlights, Tommy later stated. It was less than two minutes after their arrival that they began to hear noises which sounded like something walking through the woods on the other side of the lake following them. These sounds were followed by a loud, heavy thud which sounded like something had hit the ground with great force. We concluded it was a deer traveling through the woods, Tommy said, because you could hear something walking. When we shined our lights, the footsteps stopped. About every two to five minutes, the loud thud noise was made, along with the sound of breaking ice. Still telling ourselves it was a deer, even though we thought it mighty strange that a deer followed us down the river with very loud crashing noises being made every few minutes, both of us, after a while, decided to head back to the truck. Then, according to Tommy, a large rock weighing from 15 to 20 pounds was launched out into the middle of the river. Alarmed now, the two men ran as fast as they could the rest of the way to the vehicle. You tell me, please, what can throw a large rock that I probably couldn't throw 10 feet out into the middle of a river? When asked what he thought had thrown the rock, he replied that he didn't know, but that, whatever it was, sounded really big, not small, and must have possessed considerable strength and opposable thumbs to have hurled the rock so far. I spoke to both Tommy and his brother Jeff on January 12th and 13th, three days after the incident had taken place. Both men seemed sincere about their encounter. 
The incident occurred in a densely forested area on White City Road, near a boat dock on the White River. The sounds first began on the other side of the river, but soon moved to the same side that the men were on, which suggested the possibility that more than one creature may have been involved. Even after they realized that they were unarmed and something large and heavy was moving through the woods following them, they had kept their cool. They hadn't really been scared. Both of them claimed to me just a bit nervous until the thing threw the rock. A throw they both realized which would have been impossible for a normal man. It was dark around 7 p.m. and only 10 degrees out so the chance that it was another person was very slim. They had been in the area all day without ever having seen a single animal, an unusual note that both brothers mentioned. Nevertheless, they both came to the logical conclusion that it must be a deer, even though following humans to their cars would be considered strange behavior indeed for a deer. Each time they would walk, the sounds of crunching ice and loud thuds would ensue from the darkened woods. Whatever it was, Jeff told me, it sounded like it was at least twice as heavy as we were. We were walking along, two grown men, and hardly making any sound at all on the frozen ground. When they stopped, the sounds stopped. They both had flashlights. Jeff was more powerful than his brothers. He constantly shined his light at the area from which they judged the sounds to be emanating from, but saw nothing. They noted, with mounting alarm, that they could see no eye shine at all from this crazy deer. At this point, they thought it would be best to turn around and head back to the truck, still feeling a little nervous about the whole affair. It wasn't until they saw the rock sail 30 feet through the air that they finally became afraid. It wasn't no little pebble either, Jeff told me. I thought that whatever it was had jumped into the river. Tommy estimated that the rock to be larger than a man's head weighed 15 to 20 pounds. On seeing this, both men made a mad dash for the truck. Once at the vehicle, they wasted no time getting out of the area. Neither men know for sure what was in the woods that night, and both asked me what kind of animal could pick up a rock that big and throw it that far. There are none, of course. The case is somewhat inconclusive at best, as neither men actually saw the creature, but something followed the two brothers and threw that rock. Both men took that as a clear warning to leave the area immediately and were happy to oblige. On January 14th, just five days after the initial incident and one day after I interviewed Jeff, the undescribed beast returned to White City Road, or had never left to begin with, and was actually seen for the first time there by two motorists. Shane M., 28, and his friend John, 27. While spotlighting deer and such that night with flashlights, as their vehicle neared the boat dock, traveling only about four miles per hour, shining their light into the woods, they began to hear the sounds of heavy footsteps crunching through the ice. They slowed the car to a complete halt and listened. John, a military veteran who served in Afghanistan during the Iraq War, began taunting the person he believed was out in the darkness and responsible for making the noises. Calling him out, when the sounds of the footsteps ceased, Shane, who was driving, turned the car around and began slowly retracing their path. That was when John, who was now on the side next to the woods, yelled out, Holy shit! There! Standing in the creek next to the river, only 20 feet from the car, was a nine-foot-tall, hair-covered, snarling giant. John shined his flashlight directly into the thing's face for a full three seconds before the two, overcome with fright, sped away from the scene. The figure didn't react to the light at all, John later told me. 
It didn't turn its face away from the light. It didn't throw up its arm to block the light from its eyes. It just stood there, looking really angry and mean, with the corner of its upper lip raised in a snarl. He further described it to me as being covered in white or light gray hair about eight inches long and a little darker on the upper body. It was four feet wide at the shoulders, with an estimated weight of 1,000 pounds. It had a human-like head and face, he said, with no hair on the face except for a long beard and solid black eyes with no eye shine. They could not tell the skin color on the face, as their lights were trained on it, but said that the skin looked leathery. I was yelling out the window, telling it to come out and calling it names, but I thought it was a man at first. When I saw it standing there in the creek, I was never so scared in all my life. I've seen something bad, scary stuff in my life, but never anything like this. I will never go back to White City Road at night, you can believe that. John also admitted to me that he had experienced a similar encounter with what he now thought was the same creature three years earlier in 2008 while deer hunting alone on a creek bank in Caddis, Kentucky. It was just at dusk, he said, when a tall, hairy something suddenly walked out of the dense woods into the creek bank and into view not 50 feet from his position. I knew it wasn't a human by its size, he said. It was coming right at me. I could tell it was really heavy by the sound of each step as it hit the ground. The Iraq veteran was alarmed, of course. I didn't know what else to do, he told me. So I raised my rifle, a Winchester 300 Weatherby Magnum, and emptied it into the thing's upper body. I know I hit it at least six times. The creature never made a sound as it was being shot by the high-caliber rifle. It simply turned and, much to his relief, ran off into the woods. The would-be Bigfoot killer wasted no time in exiting the location. John claims to know several other people who have had sightings in the same area. The Hopkins County sightings continued. In September of 2012, just before 5 p.m., a well-respected member of a local church was driving along Highway 2171 near Madisonville with her infant daughter in the back seat when she saw something which she will never forget. I had picked up my child from daycare and was driving home, she later stated. I had just exited Penny Ryle Parkway and was driving on Highway 2171 when I saw an unusually tall black figure standing a little ways down the road beside a road sign. My very first thought was that this figure was working on the sign along the side of the road because its head was up as high as the sign itself. I then realized that this figure was all one solid black color from head to toe, and that it wasn't standing on anything to work on the sign, but was actually just standing there. This filled me with fear, and I felt goosebumps all over. My next thought was that I had my baby in a car seat in the back, and my motherly instinct kicked in that I needed to protect my baby. Immediately to my left was a smaller road that can be used as a shortcut as a shortcut to get to my home, but I very seldom used it because it was a narrow, winding, hilly road, so I stayed on the more straight and wide road, but not this time. As she was making the left-hand turn into the shortcut, she did something unusual for her. She stopped right there in the middle of the road. I wanted to see this thing better, she stated. I was filled with curiosity and wondered, yet I kept having this strong feeling that I did not need to go towards this figure standing down there by that sign. She sat there in the middle of the road staring at the thing. It was in a frozen stance, she stated, like in mid-stride of a very long step forward. Its arms were very long and its hands came down to its knees or even lower. One arm was stretched forward, and the other was swung backward, yet it remained completely still, as if it could not be seen. 
After a few minutes, she realized that she was blocking the road and drove on to the side road. When she looked back, the creature was gone. She assumed that it had crossed the road. She could only describe what she'd seen as extremely tall, very wide-bodied, with very long arms, and was a uniform solid black color. As for the extremely bizarre pose of the creature, the creature took on being spotted, freezing in such an awkward position, one is left to wonder, did it really think that the witness could not see it out in the open beside the road? Very unusual. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!